I'm reading from Psalm 34, the entire psalm. A psalm of David when he feigned madness before Abimelech who drove him away and he departed. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My, my soul will make its boast in the Lord. The humble will hear it and rejoice. O oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he answered me and delivered me from all my fears. They looked to him and were radiant and their faces will never be ashamed. This poor man cried and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and rescues them. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. How blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. O oh, fear the Lord, you his saints. For to those who fear him there is no want. The young lions do lack and suffer hunger, but they who seek the Lord shall not be in want of any good thing. Come, you children, listen to me, and I will teach you the fear of the Lord. Who is the man who desires life and loves length of days? that he may see good. Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. Depart from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. The eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous and his ears are open to their cry. The face of the Lord is against evildoers to cut off the memory of them from the earth. The righteous cry, and the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. He keeps all his bones, not one of them is broken. Evil shall slay the wicked, and those who hate the righteous will be condemned. The Lord redeems the soul of his servants, and none of those who take refuge in him will be condemned. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. A preacher from some years ago said that we should talk to ourselves but not listen to ourselves. Never quite figured out how that works. But here, the psalmist David, he says, I will bless the Lord. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. Now, I want to take you back to that first reading of our service from Samuel chapter, 1 Samuel chapter 21. And to take you to the previous chapter, and remind you of the setting of where this psalm emerges. David was not in an easy chair. He was not on his throne, and he was not experiencing perfectly peace and tranquil times. David had been a hunted man. He had been in the presence of King Saul. But King Saul realized that David would be king after him, and he was so enraged with jealousy for his own throne and for his legacy that he sought to kill David. Jonathan, Saul's son, who would have been king, was so devoted and so loved David that Jonathan was perfectly content to hand the kingdom over to David, who he realized was God's anointed. And, da and Jonathan said, David, I will strengthen your hands. I will help you in any way that I possibly could. It was fine with Jonathan, but it sure wasn't fine with Saul. Saul tried to kill David by 
pinning him to the wall with his spear on more than one occasion. Saul was so angry with his own son, Jonathan, that he sought to kill him. Jonathan and David, they meet. This is in 1 Samuel chapter 20. They meet out in the field in order to bid one another farewell and to commit to one another no harm. So David, in that first reading we had, he's on the run. And he flees, first of all, into Philistine territory to Gath and to the king. And he realizes that was a horrible mistake. He realizes that just as he has been a hunted man, so this man is not about to extend kindness to him. And so he leaves from there after feigning madness that he has lost his marbles. At the beginning of chapter 22, the first two verses which was also read, David depart departed from there and escaped to the cave of Adullam. He's in the wilderness. Not a great place to be if you're looking for supply. His kin, his brothers, come to him. But verse 2, everyone who was distressed, in debt, and everyone who was discontented gathered to him. And he became captain over them. Now there were about 400 men with him. Not exactly an ideal situation. He's a hunted man, he's on the run himself, and he has tagging along with him all those who were distressed, indebted, and discontent. It's been my experience that many times when people are distressed and discontented, that those who were previously the target of their discontent or their distress that sometimes the new leader becomes the target of their sentiments. So David, these were not easy times. And the future was by no means certain. But David, what's in his heart? What is beating with every heartbeat? And this is what he says. I will bless the Lord at all times. When things are going wonderfully well, as well as when things are going horribly bad, and David had been hunted, he was being hunted, and he was to be hunted in the days ahead. He had troubled times to look back upon he was in the midst of troubled times and there would yet be ample experience of trouble in the days ahead. How that speaks to where we find ourselves today. But David, he first of all makes a declaration. First of all, there is a declaration. I will bless the Lord and he says, I will bless, I will praise, I will boast, and as a result of all of this, there will be rejoicing. I will bless the Lord. And he issues then an invitation, the first of several, which come out of this psalm, an invitation for all of us to join together with him. And he says, oh, magnify the Lord with me. And let us, let us together exalt his name together. We would ask, ask David, you have just escaped from Saul. You've had no great provision along the way. You got a little bit of bread from Ahimelech the priest. And you went down to Gath and you didn't find kindness or help there, now you're out in the wilderness. What is the reason 
for why you have made this declaration and why you invite us to join with you in magnifying the Lord and exalting his name. David, he gives testimony beginning in verse 4. He says, I sought the Lord and he answered me and delivered me from all my fears. He sought the Lord. There was an answer. There was a deliverance from all of the fears. Now David hadn't imagined these things. These things were very real. It was You don't need to read between the lines much when someone throws a spear at you, not once but a couple times, to, to realize that this person is bent on my destruction. That's the situation of David. But he says, I sought the Lord. And those fears which I had, those distressing concerns, I was delivered from all of those things. David in verse 6 says, this poor man cried. I wonder, David, were you really poor? Certainly later on, he would be enormously enriched by taking the throne and from the tribute that would be brought to him, not only from Israel, but from beyond. But David here says, this poor man. But the Bible is not particularly concerned about our material and our financial advancement when it speaks of poverty, the first and primary concern is our spiritual condition. Are we poor where it really counts? Are we impoverished in eternal terms? These coins and these dollars, these resources of this world, so temporary, the Bible is pushing our attention to those things which last and those things which shall not pass away. When David says this poor man cried, he's really chiming in with what Jesus would say on the Sermon on the Mount as he began the Beatitudes, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are the poor Blessed are those who have had their eyes opened that there is an impoverishment, that there is a beggaring in their soul, and they're ready to do something about it. They're ready to set aside all of the attractions and those things which weigh upon them in this world, and they're ready to attend to those things which are eternal. David here says, this poor man cried, and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. And he says, the angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and rescues them. That reminds me of another portion of Scripture many years after David's time. But it was a conflict once again. It was a time of turbulence. I think in 2 Kings chapter 6, Elisha was the foremost prophet in the land of Israel. And there was, we read, the king of Aram who was warring against Israel. And he counseled with his servants saying, in such and such a place shall my camp be. The man of God sent word to the king of Israel, saying, Beware that you do not pass this place, for the Arameans are coming down there. The king of Israel sent to the place about which the man of God had told him. Thus he warned him, so that he guarded himself there more than once or twice. Now, the heart of the king of Aram he was bust up about this. It says he was enraged over this thing. He calls his servants and he says, I want to know which of you is a spy. There's somebody in my council chamber who is leaking secrets over to the king of Israel. Somehow, 
I want to know what's going on. And they say, O king, our, my lord, we're all innocent in this matter. Here's what's really going on. There is a prophet, Elisha, in Israel. He tells the king of Israel what words you speak in your bedroom. And the king says, I want his head. I want to wring his neck. Go and see where he is. And they say, well, he's in Dothan. We know where he is. And he sends horses and chariots and a great army there. And they came by night and the city is surrounded. Now, I love this. The attendant of Elisha gets up in the morning and he goes outside and he looks he was not blind, he could see, and he looks all around him, and behold, an army with horses and chariots was circling the city, and, his ser and, and the Elisha's servant says to him, Alas, my master, what shall we do? And he says, the prophet says, Do not fear, do not fear. For those who are with us, those who are with us are more than those who are with them. More, more, more. Then Elisha prayed and said, O Lord, I pray, open his eyes that he may see. I think that there was a wondering in the servant's uh, in his mind. He said, I, I can see perfectly well. I see that we're in trouble here. I see that this is a desperate situation and I am far from certain that this story is going to end well. But Elisha simply prayed, O Lord, open his eyes that he may see. He had been looking with the eyes of physical sight. He had been looking with the eyes of this world, but he needed to see better he needed to see what god was really up to and the lord opened the servant's eyes and he saw it says and he saw what it what it really means is and he really saw and he saw as it were for the first time like the blind men and that jesus healed and they saw for the first time here this servant. His eyes were opened and he really saw. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. God encamps around those who fear him. You remember that as the children of Israel were making their way out of Egypt and they were going along, that the tabernacle was established in the middle of the encampment with three tribes on each side. Three on the north and on the south and three on the west and three on the east. And the focal point of the encampment was the tabernacle of God. God was in the midst of the people and there is rich symbolism and rich meaning to God being right there in the midst of the people. But we also know that God was all about that encampment when they would break camp and when they would make their way forward to another place in which to pitch. We read that the fear of the Lord was upon the nations round about that God was watching over His people and protecting and keeping them in what could have been easy pickings for a foreign army. But those, those were restrained because the angel of the Lord was right there taking care of His people. Now, we have again an invitation as in verse 3. Verse 8 is another invitation. Oh, taste and see that the Lord 
is good. How blessed. How blessed. The world might not think so, but who cares about the world? It's passing away. It's fading away and all of its glory. The Word of God says, how blessed. How rich is the man who takes refuge in this God. Oh, fear the Lord, you His saints. It just makes sense that we should do so. For those who fear Him, there is no want. Young lions do lack and suffer hunger, but they who seek the Lord shall not be in want of any good thing. Invitation again. Come, you children, listen to me, and I will teach you the fear of the Lord who is the man who desires life and loves length of days that he may see good? Here's what you do. Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit, from speaking lies. Depart from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. The next section, beginning with verse 15, talks about the Lord's eyes, ears, and face and declares the position of the Lord. That the Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. Think of the earthly ministry of Jesus. Yes, there were some times when Jesus went into the house of a rich man and he enjoyed the hospitality that was offered him and his disciples. But more often than not, he was not in some great amphitheater of this world's making, but it was simply a hillside where he spoke to the people. His pulpit was the end of a fisherman's boat, and he was among the lame, the leprous, the blind, the deaf, those who were in desperate need of one kind or another, and he welcomed them. We think of the band of disciples. Perhaps Matthew was the most distinguished, but distinguished in all the wrong ways according to the customs and the bias and the prejudice of his day and ours. But David, he says, the eyes of the Lord, he's, he's zeroing in on the righteous. And his ears are open to their cry. His face is smack against evildoers to cut them off. But the brokenhearted, there's an old adage among preachers that preachers should preach to the brokenhearted because there is one in every pew, in every church pew. It's a common experience that hearts are broken and not just broken as it were in two pieces and you say oh well a little bit of glue and that'll fix together but rather what it says here crushed in spirit so broken that Humpty can't be put back together it seems crushed where there is not just two or three or four pieces but the pieces are like dust and how can it ever be put back together again? David then says, many are the afflictions of the righteous. David speaks like our Lord when Jesus said, in this world you will have trouble. But Jesus said, be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. But Jesus, he was very plain in declaring that this world is not an easy road, even for those who are walking hand in hand with God every day. David says, many are the afflictions of the righteous. He doesn't say, many are the afflictions of of those who are unrighteous, but if you come to trust in God, all will be well. You'll never have any more problems. It'll all be just a distant memory. 
and you'll walk, he says, the righteous, those who are walking in the right path, those who are trusting in God, they have trial as well. When we tell people, come to Jesus and everything will be just fine, We find ourselves in deep trouble because there are afflictions. There are afflictions for the righteous. But David's experience, David's testimony, is that the Lord is there to deliver the righteous. And there is a messianic prophecy which comes through here that points to Jesus in verse 20. How that Jesus, all of his bones, though he was pinned with nails to the cross, none of his bones were broken. And David concludes by saying, evil shall slay the wicked and those who hate the righteous will be condemned. But the Lord, he redeems the soul of his servants and none, none, here is confidence David, though troubled in the past, though trouble faced him constantly, moment by moment and day by day, and the future was far from certain, his confidence was that none of those who take refuge in him will be condemned. So we come back full circle to verse 1, and when David opens up and he says, I will bless the Lord at all times, his praise shall continually be in my mouth. We understand what he is talking about. And we understand that the way he sets for us is the way that is right and proper and true. Lord, we give you thanks and praise for your keeping power. We give you thanks that you speak very plainly and honestly about the struggles of this world but we rejoice in how that you are able to supersede. You are able to take us beyond those hardships and those difficulties. That your love is poured out upon us. We would want to respond to David's invitation to magnify and to exalt the name of our God. We would want to taste and see and to know the goodness of our God. So Lord, continue to lead us forward and ever on in praise of your great and holy name we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.